Welcome to this second presentation in our series Re Reading Revelation, where we, which we have also built as a journey in pursuit of Revelation's vision of healing. So, vision of healing, re reading Revelation. Now, <clears throat> we are in the early stages and we will have to take a little bit of a side glance to approaches to this book that are current and that uh, in some ways have taken control of the way certain audiences read this book. In some ways you might even say that it has taken the book hostage. So we have three major schools of interpretation, <coughs> uh, communities of interpretation. and. Uh, this is what <clears throat> they all claim to see, or what these schools claim that John in Revelation, John on Patmos, what he is seeing. So, preterism, that's a term for seeing the past. So you're looking at the past from our time now, saying that, that uh, Revelation is mostly about the time when John was living. It is mostly about things in the first century. And then at the opposite extreme, you have futurism. And this one claims that John is really seeing the future, and the future that interests him is the future in which we are now living. It's our time. So here is the, you could say this is the distant past, and this is very much the present. So those are very different the approaches to the book and they compete for uh, influence. And then you have a sort of middle, I could have put this in the middle, uh, historicism <coughs> that claims to say, claims to see the time from the time of John till the time of the end. So that's a much longer stretch of history. But they all have an interest in time and the time uh, of fulfillment of these symbols. <coughs> so here we could represent this <coughs> as a matter of what these various communities read. So preterism, futurism, historicism, what sort of curriculum do they have? And as you can see, the preterists, they have a big stock, stack of books and they, let's see if I can get this to work. They have Roman imperial history. And they are especially interested in the figure of Nero, the emperor Nero, who is thought to be the, the wounded beast, or it's him that is talked about in Revelation 13, uh, where the, one of the heads looked like it had a wound. So, this is the curriculum, the historical curriculum of the Preterist. As you can see, the Futurist take a, as a, is a sort of fast track. It, they don't need to read that much. So here our Futurist is reading today's newspaper. Maybe he is watching CNN or Fox News and <coughs> making some interpretations, applications using the symbols of Revelation and saying here is what the, the book is talking about and there are issues in our time. And then we have the historicist and again you can see that the historicist has a pile of books no less impressive than the pile of books that we see <coughs> in the preterist view. But these are history books, one, two, three, four, and you have to master that history curriculum in order to get things right. So these are not unfair uh, representations of what we, are <coughs> what we are seeing in these various schools. <coughs> so <coughs> who are they then, these schools of interpretation? Who, who belongs to these uh, communities, the preterists? Most academic scholars are preterists to some degree or another. 
So if you want to go to the Theological Academy, you will find a, a predominance of preterists. And yes, they think about the Roman Empire, and yes, there is attention to the figure of Nero, and the myth of Nero's return. And then the Futurists, <coughs> and this there are always some exceptions, but few, if any, academic scholars are futurists. <clears throat> but, in, but in the faith communities, especially faith communities in the U.S., and especially conservative and somewhat charismatic faith communities in the United States, most people are futurists. That Futurism has a much larger market share in popular uh, society than preterists. And here, <coughs> the preference here, uh, Russia, Middle East, communism, it changes all the time. But there are certain things that seem to recur, and there is a <coughs> sort of belief in America in the futurist uh, scheme, and the Battle of Armageddon in Revelation uh, 16, is thought to be a real physical battle uh, that will take place in the Middle East and has been predicted a number of times already. And then we had the historicists. <coughs> so again, uh, relatively few academic scholars are historicists today. That used to be different. There used to be a larger group. There used to be a sort of Protestant texture to it that across Protestant denominations one tended to be historicists. Now in the Seventh-day Adventist uh, community, interpreters <coughs> there tend to see it as a badge of honor and orthodoxy to defend historicist tenets. And what are the uh, focuses there? There is <coughs> a broader history, all of history, and not so much Roman imperial history, as church history. Those are, uh, br so broadly speaking, then who these uh, groups are. So, <clears throat> just <clears throat> let's do a little bit of a history lesson uh, from the Preterist school, because that is so dominant in the, in the academic community. So, so, the Roman Empire begins with Julius Caesar. R Rome was in de facto already an empire by the time Caesar came along, it, but it was constituted as a republic. It didn't have an emperor, even though it was expanding and growing and militarily uh, imperial in that sense. So Caesar was assassinated in the year 44 BC <coughs> in the Roman Senate, in the middle of the Rome, just like he had been, if it had been in the United States, he would have been assassinated in the Congress, in the Senate. So that's where you have to imagine. And he was assassinated because he had marched across the Rubicon, he had marched on Rome, taken a Roman army, and attacked Rome, as it were. So he had actually committed a coup d'etat. He had he had seized power and in some ways ended the Republic. So that was in really treason. That was treasonous. But the next moment, as a stroke of genius, his adopted son Augustus, as soon as Caesar had been assassinated, Caesar was also a kind of flamboyant and very sort of a Kennedy-esque type of person. So he had a lot of popular appeal and was seen as an amazing soldier. So his adopted son immediately said, Julius Caesar is not the person who committed treason. He's a hero. He's a martyr. So he salvages this, uh, the reputation and turns it around. And immediately after <coughs> Caesar has died, they vote him divine honors. They say he was a good man, and now he's in heaven, and he's almost like a god. And that was a very politically a stroke of genius. And now the longest ruling emperor will take over. He is Caesar's adopted son. He's Augustus. He is <coughs> initially 
in Roman iconography depicted as a general, as a soldier. But by and by, later on, he will assume more and more the role of priest. He will still be soldier, he will also be priest. He is, as the ruling authority, priest and president, priest and emperor. So religion and politics go hand in hand and they mutually reinforce each other. This is what we learn in the Preterist school, because the Preterist school understands, and understands it maybe better than, than most, <coughs> that the Roman Empire had power, and the Rom Roman Emperor was extremely powerful. How do you represent that? And you represent it partly by saying that the Emperor had a special connection with God. He is God's representative, and he is worthy of worship, just about. So there are Roman temples in Asia Minor, in many of the cities in Asia Minor, in Ephesus, in Pergamum. Early on, there are temples honoring Rome and honoring the Roman Empire. And this is then a <coughs> topic that seen to be a topic in the book of Revelation. <coughs> then also from the preterists, we learn some things of value, because very early on, the emperor who most likely was the emperor at the time when John was at, on Patmos, is Domitian. Domitian's dates are 81 to 91, and he <coughs> could then be the emperor at the time of Revelation. And his reputation early on became the reputation of someone who was a very bad person. He was persecuting. And the Christian community, the believing community, was subjected to persecution. But now, thanks to the preterist, we can't think that anymore. Because the myth of Domitian as a persecutor was a myth created by his successors the Emperor Trajan, Emperor Hadrian, and those people who wrote history after Domitian, they wanted to put him down, meant, wanted to make him look bad in order to make his successor look good. So there was a kind of, you, could, you cannot say that those who wrote that history wrote it objectively. They wanted to smear Domitian. In fact, they wanted to erase him. This person here on this white horse <coughs> used to be Domitian, but the head, so the head of, the, of his head here, that used to be <coughs> Domitian's head, but <coughs> the <coughs> people who followed after him, they cut off his head and put another head in there in place. That's clever. They put the head of Nerva, Nerva who was part of the uh, coup assassinating Domitian. He got now to sit on the horse that had been made to honor Domitian. <clears throat> so these are tricky things. It's not easy to navigate here. But Domitian was no worse than others. And as a persecutor, probably not worse than others. As an administrator, no worse than others. Maybe in some ways better than many others. Here is his footprint, Domitian, this arch in Asia Minor. Here is a <coughs> hippodrome or horse uh, racing track in Rome, and here are coins with Domitian. So we still have him in you know, some places, even though the <coughs> successors tried to erase him. So, again, something to thank the Preterists for. <coughs> but then they have, <coughs> in the Preterist scheme, there is the figure of Nero, who looms large and who is seen to be specifically referred to in Revelation 13 and in Revelation 17. So Nero is <coughs> the adopted son of Claudius and his mother is <coughs> Agrippina. That's her here. That's Nero's mother. She married Claudius and Claudius adopted Nero as his son, even though he had another son. He had a son that was called uh, <coughs> Britannicus, 
who was seen as the likely successor to Claudius. But <coughs> by uh, scheming with the mother and scheming on his own, Nero manages to kill his adopted father and to kill his mother in a very gruesome way and to kill his adopted brother Britannicus and to kill his wife <coughs> in a very gruesome way too. So Nero is not a very good person. <coughs> and then, but he is sort of a, he, despite his badness, he developed a reputation. In some ways people thought that it might be good that he came back. Maybe he would come back. So there arose, after Nero's suicide, after Nero's suicide, there arose a myth, the myth of Nero's return, the myth of Nero redivivus, that he would come back someday, his wound would be healed. So this character of Nero has, by preterists, been seen as a character that might fit some of the things that are described in the book of Revelation. I don't think so myself, and I have explained why in my commentary I have said that the foot of Nero is too small for Revelation symbols. So we need something bigger than that, but you get the point. There, there is a Nero uh, influence here. <coughs> so the Roman myth then, the myth of the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, is a, is a myth, but it has the element of power, Rome as a conquering power, as an irresistible military power, military superiority, a superpower. That's what they are. But then, aside from that, you also have peace and stability, and here is the altar of peace, built by the Emperor Augustus in the first century, early on, celebrating Roman power as a benign influence. We're good. We're making the world better. We only have good intentions, even though the reality is really more on the side of power, even though one-third to one-half of the population of Rome are slaves. But that is off screen. That is something we don't talk about. And here you have a scene, a detail from the altar of peace, and you have a woman, and you have, it looks peaceful, pastoral, fertile, prosperous, so you have power, peace, and prosperity. All of those things you have in the Roman myth. And you have a religious tenor. And here is an amazing thing uh, from uh, Ephesus, one of the cities of Revelation, where you see the Emperor Lucius Varius, Varus upon his death. This is the Emperor. And this is the chariot with a horse. And this is an angel that accompanies the deceased emperor to heaven, where he will take his place, not quite as a god, but as a godlike figure. So the emperor has, is well connected with God. There is a religious tenor. There was power, peace, and prosperity, and there is also providence. God is in, in this. This is the religious, this, this is a myth. And <clears throat> Paul Sanker, who has written about this and, and who is well aware of these images, this sort of messaging that you have, uh, he says, most importantly, through visual image, imagery, a new mythology of Rome and for the emperor a new ritual of power were created, built on relatively simple foundations. The myth perpetuated itself. Uh, and transcended the realities of everyday life to project onto future generations the impression that they lived in the best of all possible worlds in the best of all times. 
that's what you want people to feel and believe. That may not be exactly so. It might just be a myth. Because, <coughs> and here, I need to show you this. <coughs> so here we have the symbols of power and peace and stability here. And here we have, it's later, it's the Emperor Hadrian who follows. It's later on, but you could have had any emperor you wish. And here he has his foot on a conquered subject. He has, he's an oppressor. He's not a liberator. And thank you, thank you to those people who made that. And maybe <coughs> let us see these types of images. Now, if you are the one standing there with the foot on the subject's neck, you might think this is that you have a good time. If you are the subject whose foot is on your neck, or the one who has a foot on your neck, you might not be quite as happy. So, there is a kind of persistence and temptation of national myths. And I again want to give credit to preterists for pointing this out. I don't want to just to dismiss them, even though I have said very clearly that I think the Roman referent, the Nero referent, is too small. There is still <coughs> some message here in the myth building of Rome and the myth building that we do in our time. The sort of self-understanding we have that in some ways doesn't differ that much from Rome. So we also have, have a certain iconography of our founders. We have, uh, uh, we have our own, and this I won't <coughs> say, but there is a, the founders that were revered in Rome, and we have founders revered in our time. And we have memorials, and they are built. This one is built almost like the Pantheon in Rome. We like that building style that is <coughs> grandiose, and we have our stories of, of accomplishment just as they did in Roman times, and we have selective recall. We remember history selectively, just as the Romans left out the reality of slavery, that in some ways, this some ways was foundational to Roman pros prosperity just as they left that out and never mentioned it. Uh, so, in our time, the half has never been told. Slavery and the making of American capitalism. So there is a selectivity to the building of these national myths. And then that would be <coughs> make the preterist sort of <coughs> messaging not totally uh, uh, <coughs> uh, useless for for us. So, <coughs> Sankar again, built on relatively simple foundations, the myth perpetuated itself and transcended the realities of everyday life to project onto future generations the impression that they lived in the best of all possible worlds in the best of all times. That's what they tried to make people believe in those days. And it's not unlike what authorities try to make us believe in our time. So we have a certain thing, might be able to learn some things. <clears throat> now the historicists, I'm not going to say much about the futurists, because <clears throat> that, even though it has a huge following, uh, it is not something that, that needs to be <clears throat> discussed that much. But here is the historicist view, history from the time of John until the end, a tendency to say that the book of Daniel is the most important book uh, from Revelation and that the sort of pattern uh, and, and vision and application of the things we have in Revelation is influenced, strongly influenced or controlled by Daniel in the Old Testament. We have church history here, not so much Roman. We have a tendency to focus, or in the historicist scheme, to focus on the Roman Catholic Church and the contest, the sort of division, Catholicism versus Protestantism. We have a story of apostasy and restoration, and 
we have a tendency in historicism similar to futurist historicism and the time of the historicist. The interpreter finds himself or herself in the story. So, and the story tends to end in the days of the interpreter and for some time that has been a challenge to historicists because one has said now it is ending and then it didn't, didn't happen like that. And so I wish to point out a few problems with, with these schools of interpretation uh, and, and yes I am the most dismissive of the futurist, that's true. <coughs> because, and that's not just true because of the events that the futurists uh, put into it, but more for the theology, for the, <coughs> for the embrace of violence and, and in some ways the crudity of the futurist interpretation. But all of these schools are time-centered and event-centered. What could they be otherwise? Well, they could be God-centered. That would be an alternative, but they tend to be time and event centered. And all demand a type of expertise that is rarely achievable for the ordinary person. I find that to be quite problematic. So remember those piles of books for the preterist and the piles of books for the historicist? That if that is a sort of curriculum you have to master, that will not easily be achievable for the ordinary person. Simply reading the Bible will not, will not do. <clears throat> so, not to say that the ordinary person is ignorant. I do not want to underestimate uh, the uh, potential of ordinary people, but there is a problem here. So this <clears throat> leads to a line of demarcation between the expert and the lay reader. So, Revelation is a book for the expert. We need someone to explain it to us. Ordinary people cannot do this on their own. So we have divide, division into communities. We don't, we, the ordinary person in the community, we don't understand Revelation. But we have someone in our community who understands it for us. That is tend tending to be, so we do understand it but we understand it vicariously through the resident expert that we have. So, <clears throat> so then <clears throat> let's, uh, uh, I, I'll pause for a second and we will move to the next slide. So the shortcomings we are talking about here can also be seen in a sort of communal, communal uh, sense because we have we have a tendency to form silos. So these silos, they stand there and they are totally independent of each other and, and they do not uh, communicate. So we have separate uh, approaches, separate interpretive communities. We have, for some communities, especially for the futurists and the historicists, the commitments they have are a major co uh, element in their sense of identity. So futuristic uh, interpretations uh, tends to have uh, a lot of interest in, in the Middle East, in American uh, issues, and uh, tends to influence politics in America. Many people in the U.S. Congress have read the Left Behind series, the futuristic interpretation uh, of the Book of Revelation. And also in the historicist community, you think that this is something that shapes your identity. <coughs> and each community, they don't know much about the other communities and, and may want to keep it that way. So I know that in my community, there is little awareness of what the preterists are doing. Uh, and to say, oh, it's about the Roman Empire, oh, it's about the Emperor Nero. Some people in, in that historicist community have never heard that before and never really seriously engaged with it. 
or thought that you needed to take that interpretation seriously. So I have tried to take views seriously that I don't necessarily share and engage with them. <coughs> so this <coughs> then leads to, to some <coughs> what you might call admission requirements that before you start reading the book, you are supposed to put on your eyeglasses and put on a certain way of looking. So it could be the historicist eyeglasses, it could be the eyeglasses of the preterist or the eyeglasses of the futurist. You have a sort of preconceived idea, preconceptions, a, what some people call for understanding, understanding before you start reading. <coughs> and those commitments are <coughs> bring a certain curriculum and you remember that there was a pile of books that uh, apply if you are doing uh, preterist uh, readings and there is a pile of books that you have to uh, relate to when you do historicist readings and these are these are daunting requirements and may actually be serious deterrents to actually engaging with the story that we have in this book. So is there an alternative? Well, <coughs> if there is an alternative, and yes, there is an alternative, uh, then that begins with looking at, at the person who uh, gave, uh, gave us this book to look at, John on Patmos and to discover him as a reader and as a seer. So he, what's his text? His text is the Bible, his text is the Old Testament. And he has read it well, because he seems to have such an amazing command of this book, easy recall. He can just help himself to all kinds of ideas. And, and from the whole book, not just one book, but all of these, <coughs> all of these uh, books. So he, he is at home in Genesis. Uh, he is at home in, in uh, Daniel. Here he is at home in Ezekiel. He has mastery of these Old Testament texts. It's not simply one book, not Daniel only, for instance, but these other books too. Yes, he runs across the whole the spectrum of the Old Testament. And then he is a seer, that the seeing is not independent of the reading he has done. Seeing and reading go together. So <clears throat> we can picture him here at the desk writing, but uh, it isn't quite like that if you think this, that this, uh, the book that, that he is looking at here is the Old Testament that he's sort of looking up stuff. Don't even think about it. He is not needing to look things up. He has looked things up already. He can do this. This is not that like this would be fitting for me. That's how I do it. I sit there with sources and books and footnotes and references and I struggle with it. But his this is an integrated vision. It is symphonic. His command of the Old Testament is a symphonic command. And his vision then integrating that, those together, it is, it is a masterful, masterful composer. <coughs> so someone here, <coughs> Austin Ferrer, who has written a couple of books and is considered by some the most important thinker, the most important biblical interpreter in the Anglican communion in the 20th century. He, he says about the way John goes about it, let's read it. No other New Testament author felt himself called to the same task. No other set himself to capture a visionary experience of the last things by intense and systematic meditation on the whole prophetic tradition. So far from reading like an attempt to communicate a previous visionary experience, what was it I saw, what was, what was that? It isn't like that. The revelation reads like a fresh and continuous scriptural meditation conceived in the very words in which it is written down, as though, in fact, <laughs> 
the author is thinking with his pen. That is an amazing way of seeing it. A feet not all out of the way, for have we not all done it from time to time? Perhaps when we were writing a familiar letter and thinking no faster than we wrote. That's seeing John on Patmos at work. How amazing is that? But the thinking, the reading he has done, the whole scriptural meditation, that is the, what we have to think about. And then there is my mentor, Richard Bauckham, <coughs> who was whose books I have treasured. And it was because of him I wanted to go to St. Andrews because I was uh, quite impressed by, by his um, work on Revelation prior to going there. But he says in his book, in one of his books, John was writing what he understood to be a work of apocalyptic scripture, the climax of prophetic revelation, which gathered up the prophetic meaning of the Old Testament scriptures and disclosed the way in which it was being and was to be fulfilled in the last days. So here again, someone who has in his thought world, there is the whole of the Old Testament, and it is as though he knows that my book will be the climax of prophecy. It is as though he is aware that there is a genesis at the beginning of this book, and there will be a revelation at the end of the book, and I am the one doing that. So some people, scholars, they, <coughs> there is this saying that you will publish or perish, that you have to publish something. You sit down, you write, will you get it published? Where will you get it published? And my wife is a scientist, medical scientist. She has published more than 300 articles in, in her career. And each time, where will I publish? And <coughs> so we ask John, where are you going to publish this? <coughs> and John tells us, <coughs> I'm going to publish it in the Bible. That's where I will publish it. That's how high he aims. You know, that is amazing. That's the thinking here. But to make that your aim, you cannot have something that is narrow. You have to have something that is broad, something that fits as a conclusion, that puts the things together. And sure enough, this is what we are getting in this book. It will then be too narrow to read with the preterists, with their first century sort of orientation. It will even be too narrow to read with the historicists, even though they have a longer and more comprehensive vision, because he wants to do the totality of Revelation and bring the whole story to completion. So, <clears throat> more than a second volume of Daniel then, but a volume that reflects, that interacts with the whole Old Testament. <clears throat> so. On this logic, we can say that the book of Revelation is not all about time, as these schools of interpretation put it. It is interested in past, present, and future, as we read in Revelation 1.19. The horizon goes back to primordial time and to the end of time. It is interested in human reality, not just certain sort of <coughs> randomly select selected historical events. It is interested in values more than in events. It is not the event, but the value that is promoted and that is also put at risk in, in real life. That is uh, the focus of the book. And then we have a cosmic perspective. It isn't just human history. It is cosmic reality, and we need to look at that. Uh, and you can see then <coughs> the sort of face is not just oriented to the future here, it's oriented to the past. It's all over the place. And our line, if this is a timeline, then the timeline goes to the end of time and to the beginning of time. It is comprehensive. So who is who in Revelation? And this is my final illustration. <coughs> so there is a triangular shape to Revelation's view of reality. We have God, 
We have human reality and we have a non-human reality. The non-human reality is both good and bad. There are good angels and there are bad angels. There are beings that are opposed to God. And you cannot understand reality just by looking at God and humans because what the non-human reality represents is crucial to the way this story unfolds. And this is the problem with schools of interpretation because they tend to collapse things into this, uh, this bag here, this sphere here, God and humans, human history, whether first century history or all of history at the expense of the cosmic perspective. And yes, there is a tendency to attribute to God things that the text wishes to assign to the non-human agent here. So God is seen as the one behind the calamities of the trumpets, the calamities of the bowls, even though Revelation strives to show that it is the other side that's doing it. So. <coughs> We have then a question, what did the schools of interpretation do to the non-human entity? And the answer is that it tended to eclipse it. It tended to downplay it and in some ways obscure it. And that leads to a very different theology, a different message in this book. <coughs> so now thinking back to my first presentation and then uh, uh, adding it up uh, after this one, so, <clears throat> looking back, if we ask the novelist, the literary critic, the psychologist, or the philosopher, or the Protestant reformers, or biblical scholars, <clears throat> with, quite a f with few exceptions, or popular culture, especially popular religious culture, and especially popular religious culture in America, if we ask them, they will answer that revelation is not a vision of healing, that revelation is mostly a message of divine retribution. It is retribution, not revelation. And it is retribution, not healing. Those are contrasts. And then we'll do one more. If we ask the preterist or the futurist, or the historicist, who is doing what in the book of Revelation? They all tend to ascribe to God actions of the opposing side in the cosmic conflict. So it is not just what is the historical reality that these symbols point to. It is also what is the theological message of these symbols and the tendency is to ascribe to God what the other side is doing. That obviously changes things dramatically. So then these schools have in common that they make it harder to read Revelation for what it is. Uh, that to read Revelation for what it is, a vision of healing. What needs to happen then is to restore these proportions to get our triangle back in shape and to remove the X from the non-human reality and reinstate that and then see what we, co what we come up with and then see that we have a clear path to a vision of healing.